his, his uh, father's concubines. And so therefore, because he did that, he was no longer eligible to be the one to be the heir uh, of uh, Jacob's estate. And you'll find a little bit more today about what happens also in this whole story. We looked at this to remind ourselves that Joseph comes from a very dysfunctional family. There were favoritisms, there was deceit, and there was all kinds of stuff in his life. And we picked up the story last week where he was 17 years old where his father gave him a coat, a special coat. We were reminded that that coat was a, a coat that was almost like a royal coat that no one would wear that would go out and take care of sheep, uh, which is what they did. And it was also like he was esteeming on Joseph that he would be the one to actually be the heir, even though he was child number 11. This caused all kinds of problems. And it only gets worse today. The main theme of Joseph's life is this beautiful, assuring, unbelievable phrase. But the Lord was with Joseph. Today I'm going to be reading from Genesis which is where his life is recorded. It's the first book of the Bible written by Moses. And as I said last week, uh, verse, uh, chapters 37 to 50 cover the life of Joseph. And if you know, uh, I almost switched this uh, in December, but I decided not to because I felt the Lord was not wanting me to do that. But we went through finding your spiritual promised land, remember? And how God calls us out of Egypt and how they were in Egypt. This story is the foundational story of how they get to Egypt. To begin with, is from this whole mess. So I'm going to pick up the story today from last week, starting in Genesis chapter 37, beginning with verse 12. I'm not going to have the words on the screen. I just want you to listen to it. And let me just... Let me just uh, clarify some things. In the Bible, there are portions of Scripture, books, if you will, Paul's letters, for example, to the churches in the New Testament. They are all instructional words. They tell you what you're doing that is correct, what you're doing that is wrong, and what you should do. It, they're instructional. Then there's passages of Scriptures, books, if you will, that are poetic in nature. Psalms is a poetic book, so it's Proverbs and the Psalms of Solomon. Then there are other books. For example, the book of Acts. It's a narrative. It's telling the story of how the New Testament church started. The Gospels are narrative. They tell the story of Jesus and his, his ministry here for the three years that he was here on earth doing his, his ministry. This particular text, the book of Genesis, is narrative. It's telling you a story. It's telling us how God created the heavens, how God calls Abraham. All of it is narrative. So from the narrative story, we have to find out what was going on in the story. How God was working, what God was pleased with, what God was not pleased with, how the people reacted and what they initiated to kind of help look at how those things can affect us. So this story is a narrative story, so I want you to listen, picture it, if you will, in your mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel, that's Jacob, said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well. Joseph replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Huron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I've heard them say, let's go to Doroth. 
So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dureth. But they saw him in a distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben, who's the firstborn, heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the desert. But don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and to take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing. And they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh. And they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Midian merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes he went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't here. Where can I turn now? And then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornament robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. And Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons, daughters, came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said. In mourning will I go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officers, the captain of the guard. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today with this story that has been brought to us because you wanted it to be. You ordained for it to be in Scripture. Now, from it, what is it that you would say to us? What are the lessons that we can learn? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a story here that uh, has three, some, three compelling elements in it in the life of Joseph. First of all, I want you to understand that you see that Jacob sent Joseph. He sent him. Now, what's so interesting about this is that the ten brothers have gone to Shechem. Shechem is, uh, let me just bring you into light about Shechem. And it's strange that they would go there. First of all, you remember that I have mentioned that Jacob has a daughter by the name of Dinah. Dinah was cornered by a man from Shechem, and he had his way with her and raped her. What's interesting about that story, and sad at the same time, is that Jacob, who is the father, is extremely passive. Nothing about it. 
In fact, he's passive about a lot of things. So what has happened after the rape of his daughter, not Reuben, but the next two brothers, Simon and Levi, take matters in their own hands. They hightail it to Shechem, where they kill the men of that little city, that little village. They slaughter all the men, these two brothers, and they ransack every home. Jacob becomes furious that they've done this because you're, 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 you're going to make a stench to all the people around us. And all of a sudden, these brothers have gone down to take their father's flock to Shechem. Isn't that strange? I mean, why, why would they go there? Of all the places. We don't know. We can only imagine why they would go there. But to go there where this has happened to their, to their uh, sister, where the brothers have done what they've done, you would think that they, of all places, they wouldn't go back there, but they did. They go down there. And I don't know what Jacob was thinking. Maybe he was thinking, uh, well, why did my boys go down there? Uh, are they in danger because of what they've done? And Jacob then sends Joseph. <coughs> Joseph and Benjamin have not gone with them. They're the youngest. Now, I don't know if you thought that was strange, but I'm not really sure what Jacob is thinking. Can we be honest? First of all, he has sent Joseph, his favorite son, who's 70 years old, he has sent him to a various dangerous situation. It's really dangerous for two reasons. The first reason, of course, is the area in which he's sending, where his daughter was raped and where his sons have killed all these men. You would think that you would not be sending your precious son to a situation like that, but he does. The second thing that makes it dangerous for Joseph to go where he's going, I mean, where is Jacob? Does he not realize the animosity that these brothers have for him. I see you guys are laughing. I didn't mean to be so dramatic. <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> when I see the young people laughing, I realize I've done something wrong. <laughs> but I mean, think about it. Is he out to lunch about, about the, the hatred, the tension that's in your room? The harsh words that we found out last week that were always spoken to Joseph from his brothers? I mean, why, why would he send him into this situation? It, 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 it's strange. It's really like a setup. people to have done it. It's the dad that did it. He sends him down there and, and Joseph goes down there. And it almost implies that Joseph gets a little lost. He's wandering in the fields and the guy comes up and says, hey, time out, what are you looking for? I'm looking for my brothers. My father has sent me to find out what's going on with them, if they're good, if things are going well with them. I, can't, I don't know where they are, but here's where they, they're not here any longer. They've now left. And so, off he goes to find them. And remember last week that the brothers have two things in here when it comes to Joseph. Hate and envy. They hate it because he's favored. And they envy him because of the special gift of what? The coat. The coat. So Joseph is in a situation because, number one, Jacob sends him. Number two, the brothers now react to Joseph. They react. As you know, this family is filled to the brim with hostility, anger, frustration. And now they are reacting to him. They see him from afar. And the reason that they, the scriptures imply that they see him is why? They can see his coat. I mean, it's such a special coat. 
made of so many colors. And it's an unusual coat that you wouldn't see in the area in which he's traveling. And as soon as they see him, they come up with a plan. Can you see them with their clenched teeth? Here comes that trailer. Let's kill him. I mean, now think about that. We go over those words so fast. I mean, it's not that they're saying, we hate him, we dislike him, uh, let's beat him up. No, let's kill him. Let's take the most, the most precious thing from him, his life. Let's do it. Let's kill him. I mean, you talk about action to have for a 17-year-old boy. Be your own brother at that. And as you know, this whole thing at this time was in their hearts. This anger, this hate. Now it has left their hearts and has gone into their mind. Where now they're going to plan it out. You see, my friend, uh, they had been tempted to do something. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? The only reason that it hadn't occurred yet is because why? There was no opportunity. Isn't that kind of like you and I? You've been tempted to do something. And inwardly you go, mm -hmm. that's exactly what I'm going to do. When the opportunity gives itself. How many of you have done that before? Oh. I'm the only one. <laughs> you cowards. <laughs> We've all done that. We've all had this opportunity. Uh, and then we go forward. And that's exactly what's going on with these brothers. There now is this opportunity to react in a way violent, conniving, selfish. You find these components in the way that they are reacting to this favorite son. So in the story that I just read, we find that, that, that Jacob sent Joseph, and now we see the reaction that the brothers had towards Joseph. Reuben, of course, has come to the rescue, this firstborn. And he says, hey, listen, wait a minute. Time out. This is our brother. We, we, we can't murder him. I'll tell you what, here's an open sister. Let's just throw him in there and teach him a lesson. In the back of his mind, when my opportunity comes, I'll come and I'll get him out. And I'll take him back to Dad. As you know, he comes back later. We're not sure exactly where he went if he had to do something with the sheep. But he gleams and comes back and finds that, what? Joseph is not there. And he tours his... That when they tear their clothes in the Bible, it means that they're in deep, deep remorse and just utter grief. It's just a sign of what they did. This is why Jacob does it later on when he finds that Joseph is gone. I mean, this grip. And this is exactly what has happened to Reuben when he... Where, where's Joseph at? And the brothers, Judah... And by the way, is the head clan of the tribe of Judah in which Jesus comes, the tribe of Judah. He says, listen, Reuben's right. We can't really kill the brother. I mean, after all, he is a flesh and blood. Look, there's a caravan. There's a caravan of merchants. I tell you what, let's do. Let's at least get some money out of this whole thing. Let's sell him. Let's sell him for 20 pieces of silver. That's exactly what they do. Look, let's let him go off, off to Egypt. Way, 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 way far away from us. We'll see what happens to his dreams. We're going to get away with this. I mean, there's no way if he goes all the way down to Egypt. There's no way his dreams are going to come true. There's no way that we will ever see him again. In other words, we're not really going to kill him physically. That way we're not really guilty with blood on our hands. But what we're going to do is our life is going to be as if he is dead. Because he's no longer going to be connected to us. And no one's going to know it. And they've sent him. 
My, my son Jonas is 15. I mean, in two years, I mean, I'm thinking, can you imagine? We're going to give you to a bunch of mean strangers that are just going to use you to get you out of our life. Boy, what a reaction. What a reaction that is going on towards Joseph. The father has sent him. He has obeyed his father. And in the midst of this, there is this overbearing hatred towards him that he receives. Not from the enemy, but from his own brother. So we see in this story, Jacob sent him almost like a setup. And then the brothers, the brothers' reaction. Next, we see in this story, the last part, is that there is deception that surrounds Joseph. Deception that surrounds him. Now, can you imagine, while they're eating, I mean, I can't imagine even just sitting down, I mean, you just throw this guy into a cistern where there's no, where there's no water. There's probably snakes you know, this kind of thing in there. Come on, picture the story. Enter into it. They've taken off what? The robe. I mean, that special gift that daddy's given to him. It's got to go first. Let's put him in there. And can you imagine sitting down and having a bowl of sandwich and some chips and a doctor while Why, this is going on. And this noise of, 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 of Jacob pleading, begging. And all the while, you mean much. Isn't it amazing how sin can harden one's heart? It can. It does. And we see this in this story. What they do, they get a goat. Kill him and dip this and dip this this, this special coat in, in blood. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's think that he's I mean, after all, what we've just done now becomes the question: what are we gonna tell dad? And how are we gonna cover our tracks? How many of you have ever had to do that before? Come on. What am I gonna do now that this has happened? And how am I going to cover my tracks? We've all done that. They come up with this plan. We'll kill this. We'll kill this animal. We'll dip the blood on it, smear it all over, and we'll take this back to Dad. And the old man, Jacob, falls for the deception. It is my son's problem. Some, some sort of animal must have gotten a hold of him on the way and has torn him to pieces. My son has dead. Now, can you imagine doing that to your dad? Do you get that? Um, we, we look at the story so so casually. That they now they've now caused their dad. He, and, and, and here's the story. He grieves for 20 years. 20 years are going to pass before he sees Joseph. In fact, he doesn't even think he's ever going to see him again. And to think. You see, my friend, when you're when, once you've mistreated one person, it's easy to mistreat the next person. They've mistreated their own brother, now it's going to be easier now to mistreat their own dad. I mean, how brutal would that be? And that's what we find. And guess what they do? They allow the lie. They, they, they formulate the lie. They let their dad believe the lie. And there is this humongous cloud deception. And what's so strange is it runs into this first chosen family. It happened with Abraham and Sarah. 
Here's Abraham and Sarah. You know, the Bible is just so cool how it talks about people sometimes, and it always says that the, most of the time it says, you know, what their appearance are. You know, when it talks about Joseph, he's a good-looking man. Well, it talks that about Rachel, remember, who's married to uh, Jacob. It also said that about Sarah. You remember the deception that Abraham did. He's traveling, and he's got his wife with him, and he's going to go to this foreign place, and he's captured, and he says to Sarah, listen, you're so good-looking. I, I, I'm praying for my life that if he knows that you are my wife, he's going to kill me so he can have his way with you. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to save you, my sister. That kind of, doesn't that seem like a coward? He does. He follows through with them. Abraham, the father of our faith. And he says to them, to the king, this is my sister. Well, guess what the king does? The king starts to know. Where's my wife? <laughs> Sorry, so the past is Sarah. This does not go well with God. And God starts to afflict the king until the truth comes out. When Abraham finally confesses, she's not my sister. She's my wife. What? What? Why did you put me in such danger? Deception. We visited deception last week with Jacob himself and his brother Esau when he deceived his father Isaac and pretended that he was him and got the blessing and stole the blessing from Esau. The deception. You also saw where, where Jacob, when he becomes a man, and man, he just is so, he just knocked over head over heels for Rachel. And he asked, her daddy, can I, can I have her? Well, I will work for you for seven years so that I can have this, this daughter of yours. Seven years, that's a long time. Seven years passes. And the night of the consummation, I mean, he wakes up the next morning, and it's not with Rachel, it's with his her older sister Leah. Total deception. I fooled you. And now. Is visited again on Jacob by his sons. Your son, Joseph, is dead. He's gone. Can you imagine the guilt? I mean, after all, Jacob is the one who sent him. We find this going on. In this story, you find a setup. You find reaction, and you find deception. Are those elements in your life? Think about it. Have you ever felt set up for failure? Have you? I mean, think about it. Come on. Have you felt at times that someone really set you up? Maybe it was your parents. Maybe, maybe it was like Joe. Maybe it was like Jacob, who didn't really realize what he was really doing. Maybe it was somebody in your family that really knew what they were doing. Maybe it was a spouse. Maybe it was a sibling. But they set you up. Maybe you've been the one that has been the recipient of some reaction. Some hatred. Some scheme against. Maybe there's been some deception that has come in your life and maybe even work its way out through your life. We find these components in this story. So the question is, how does God want to work in your life? story. Even with those elements. Because as you know, as we find out, God is at work in the life of Joseph. God is in the life of you, my friend. I don't know if you know it, whether you could ever think of someone, maybe you come from the perfect background, but listen, my friend, you have an enemy that's seeking to set you up. You do. You've experienced it. 
you've also experienced that kind of reaction from the enemy. How many of you know when you seek to be able to go after God, how many of you know that you have a reaction from the enemy? If you think the enemy is just going to sit by and let you just really pursue God, you've got another thing coming. Yeah. You're deceived. One of his biggest weapons is deception. Yeah. This is why Jesus spoke. You shall know the truth. The truth. And the truth will set you free. He said, do you not know? And this is what is so cool about Jesus. He's in the story. In fact, he's Joseph in the story. You think of that. I mean, really. Here is Joseph. Who is what? Who is the beloved son? Who is rejected by the brethren? He is. Who has such hate that sell him out just like they did Jesus. Jesus comes and leaves his place and comes, takes off his royal robe. He, he becomes a slave in the sense of his limitations, just like you and I. This is exactly what's going to happen to Joseph. He becomes a slave. And yet he rises to what? To a position of authority in the palace in order to do what? To save those he rejected, rejected him. That's exactly what Jesus is. Jesus is able, willing, no matter what kind of setup has gone through, no matter what kind of reaction has gone through in your life, no matter what kind of deception is surrounding you, Jesus is able and willing. Amen. The takeaway from this is this. Here's your application. What do you do with those people? What do you do with those people that maybe have set you up unknowingly? Well, maybe knowingly. What, what do you do with those people that react to you, that, that, that bully you, that are harsh to you, that mistreat you? Here's the answer from Jesus. 